ici pour la soutenance de notre euh, ami Lou Saloin. Et euh, j'ai le plaisir d'introduire le jury à uh, uh, American uh, expert is Vincent Poor from Princeton University, present by Sky. Uh, next, another expert reviewing the thesis is Pierre Fouillou, Sorbonne Université. Euh, nous avons aussi dans le jury Pierre, Philippe Sibla, euh, Télécom Paritech. Euh, des encadrants de la thèse, two uh, thesis supervisors, Marceau Kupchou et Shung Shi Chen, euh, respectivement Télécom Paritech, Nokia Bell Labs. Et je présiderai cette séance, je suis professeur de la centrale supérieure. Et euh, Lou, vous avez 45 minutes à nous convaincre. Merci. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present you my PhD thesis on resource allocation and optimization for the non-orthogonal multiple access. My name is Lou and this thesis is supervised by Marceau Kupchou from Telecom Paris and Calvin Chen from Nokia Bell Labs. Uh, this presentation is divided in five sections and I will start by introducing the context and motivation. Uh, then I will talk about our contributions before going into the main content. So, as we all know, 5G is currently being deployed and it targets three use cases. First, enhanced mobile broadband, which is expected to improve the mobile user's uh, experience, in particular for video streaming, virtual reality, and augmented reality applications. Secondly, uh, massive machine type communication, uh, which is expected to increase massively the number of connected devices for IoT applications. Uh, it can be, for example, for smart homes, connected cars, uh, and, and sensor networks, for example. And finally, uh, ultra-reliable and low-latency communications is meant for mission-critical uh, kind of communications that are uh, autonomous cars, industrial automations, and remote surgery. In order to meet the increasing demand of mobile data, and the requirements of 5G and beyond 5G networks, it is important to develop new radio access technologies as well as new radio resource management schemes. And this will be the focus of our work. Uh, the non-orthogonal multiple access is a promising te technology as it allows to serve multiple users on the same time and frequency resource. It can increase the network spectral efficiency, support massive connectivity, and improve cellage user's performance. However, complex decoding is required at the, the receiver, and the radio resource and interference management becomes more difficult to manage, to optimize. The key challenges in NOMA, and in particular for radio resource management, are first power control and then subcare allocation. Uh, when these two problems are considered jointly, it is called the joint subcarrier and power allocation, uh, JSPA in the following. And there are three categories of such problems. The first is utility maximization, which consists in <coughs> maximizing a utility function of the system's data rate. For example, the total system throughput or a proportional fair allocation of the data rates among the users. Secondly, power minimization consists in minimizing the system's power consumption, given some minimal quality of service constraints uh, and requirements for each user. Finally, energy efficiency optimization combines the above two by maximizing the ratio between uh, the system's data rate and the power consumption. In this thesis, we will only consider the first category of problems. In these problems, a lot of algorithm has been developed. For example, for power control, uh, some people use the fractional transmit power control heuristic. 
uh, we can also employ the well-known water filling algorithm. And for subcar location, uh, people have used match matching theory, dynamic programming, and many heuristics. The first issue with that is that there is no unified framework. There is no common uh, general problem formulation that covers all the utility scenarios and constraints used in the literature. Uh, and so there's no common algorithmic properties that was uh, studied and that can be reused from one problem to the other. A second issue is that all these work are either optimal algorithms with very high and impractical complexity or uh, low complexity heuristics without any performance guarantees in theory. So there is no low complexity algorithm with performance guarantees. So uh, in this work, we'll show uh, a unified framework with a generic ob objective function that covers most utilities used in the literature. We'll define two sets of basic normal constraints that are used in all uh, JSPA problems. And we believe that they can be extended to new scenarios. We'll study some simplifying properties that will help the algorithm design. For example, separability and convexity of the objective function or knapsack constraints. And finally, we'll show that there exist intra intractable structures that make the problem difficult to solve, which are uh, namely the mp harness of combinatorial problems. And then we'll use this framework to study uh, three problems. The first one is to derive some computational complexity in section three. The second one is to study the weighted sum rate maximization problem with cellular power constraint in section four. And finally, we also study the sum rate maximization with individual power constraint that will not be presented here due to time constraint. So let me first uh, explain what is the principle of NOMA. I will do this through some example in the downlink, and I will also explain the system model. So what's the difference between NOMA and OMA? NOMA allows to serve multiple users on the, on the same uh, subcarriers, as shown here in this uh, illustration, where the two colors correspond to the power location of two different users. And on the x-axis, we have our time and frequency resource that we call subcarrier. To mitigate interference due to signal superposition, we employ successive interference cancellation, SIC. Before going into the example, I will first define what is the achievable data rate of a user k, defined by Shannon's capacity formula. It is rk, uh, a function of the bandwidth allocated to this user k, wk, and the signals-to-noise ratio, SNR. So first, let's start with uh, the OMA case. One base station wants to serve two users, uh, and it has a limited bandwidth W. It will cut this bandwidth uh, into two pieces that do not interfere with each other of proportion alpha and one minus alpha, as we can see here. So that the received signals are uh, independent and do not interfere with each other. With this, we get these, the following SNR where G1 corresponds to the channel gain of user one, and P1, uh, the transmit power to user one. So the, the product of G1 and P1 is the receive power of user one. At the denominator, we have uh, the noise, which is characterized by the bandwidth allocated to user one multiplied by N0, the power density, uh, the, sorry, the noise power density. Okay, and it's the same for user two. With this, we can derive the following uh, uh, capacity for these two users. Now, let's talk about the NOMA case. In NOMA case, this base station chooses to serve both users on the same subcarrier, on the same bandwidth, without uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, avoid interferences. So the receive signal of both users is a superposition. And the signals over interference plus noise ratio is like this. We see that uh, in the interference term, in the denominator, we have this interference term. However, what happens is that the strong user, user two, will try to apply SIC as I said earlier. In this case, we assume that user one has a worse channel condition than user two. So if user one can decode its own signal, it means that user two can also decode the signal of user one. This is represented in this block here. 
as summarized below, the strong user will decode the signal of, of the weak user and then subtract it from the superposition before decoding its own signal. And so we can have uh, in its uh, SNR formula uh, a mitigation of the interference. And we get uh, these data rates. By combining this formula of data rates, we can compare, no, compare NOMA and OMA in this graph where the x-axis corresponds to the data rate, the normalized data rate of user 1, and the y-axis is the normalized data rate of user 2. NOMA1 corresponds to the case that we just described where the strong user decode the weak user signal, and NOMA2 NOMA corresponds to the contrary where the weak user tries to decode the strong user signal. As we, and we also plot uh, the classical orthogon orthogonal multiple access and time division multi, uh, multiple access. What we can see is that NOMA indeed outperforms the classical OMA. However, the decoding order is very important as we can see NOMA2 uh, actually has worse performance than uh, uh, OMA. So this is a known result. There exists an optimal SIC decoding order in the downlink. And it is that we first decode the weak user before decoding stronger user. And this property is not true for Umplink. In the Umplink, the decoding order depends on which uh, operating point in the capacity region we want. <coughs> so this is our system model. We consider one base station serv serving K users on N subcarriers. The bandwidth of a subcarrier is denoted by WN, and the channel gain of a user on a subcarrier is GKN. We define similarly the noise power, eta, and PKN is the allocated transmit power to user K on subcarrier N. The SIC decoding order on a particular subcarrier N is defined as a permutation, pi, such that pi of 1 equals 4 means that user 4 is decoded first. There is this optimal decoding order where we start from the uh, weakest user and weak in terms of noise divided by the channel gain. To simplify this formula, we define eta tilde as the normalized noise over channel gain. And finally, we consider the SIC constraint that is used throughout the literature uh, due to, um, this is implemented to represent the decoding capacity uh, capabilities of the system uh, due to, for example, decoding complexity uh, of the hardware or um, error propagation issues in practice. And it states that the number of superposed signals per subcarrier has to be limited uh, to be at most m, where m is the chosen value given by the scenario of the system. <clears throat> and we define the downlink data rate of user k by rk, where here we see that at the numerator, we indeed have the receive power, and at the denominator, we have the interference term plus noise, where interference are the, the receive power from the user that are later in the decoding order. And here, to simplify the formula, we divide everything by GK, and we obtain this formula below, where uh, the channel gains now appear inside the uh, normalized noise eta tilde. And we also have this notation, so our Kn means the data rate of user K on subcar N. So it's, it's equivalent to this term here without the sum in front. And bold R, which is the vector of all data rates in the system. Now let's define what is our uh, general optimization framework and we'll study its computational complexity. So since we, we consider only utility maximization problem, uh, there are problems of this form where m is a utility function depending on the data rates, which themselves depend on the allocated power. We consider uh, a general class of utility functions that cover most utilities in the literature, which are the weighted generalized mean um, that can be expressed like this with two parameters, some weights, uh, for one for each user, w, and a parameter i that corresponds to which utility function we are considering. For example, if i equal 1, we get the, the, the famous uh, weighted sum rate problem. And if in addition the weights are equal, we get the sum rate problem. If i equals 0, we have the proportional fairness utility. 
if i equal minus 1, we get the harmonic mean utility. And finally, if i equal minus infinity, it is the max mean uh, utility. So all these utilities are used in the literature, and I believe that most utility used in the literature actually belongs to this class. After choosing one utility function for our system, we can optimize them by optimize it by trans subcarrier and power location. Here I show a simple example with three users and four subcarriers. The first thing we want to do is allocate the subcarrier. Here m equals two, so it means that each subcarrier can only be allocated to at most two users. If a subcarrier is allocated to a user, then this user can have positive power on it, otherwise its power is zero. For example, here P31 equals zero means that user three is not allocated to subcarrier one. <coughs> and then, oops, sorry. And then we can perform power control. And of course, we, we are subject to some power constraints uh, from the system. So we define two sets of basic normal constraints. The first one is the cellular power constraint, where C1 here represents the total power available uh, at the base station for downlink transmission. And it's, it is called Pmax. C2 represents the maximum power that can be transmitted on a single subcarrier. These constraints can be set if we want to um, represent um, hardware or amplifier uh, physical limits. But otherwise, it can be removed without changing the complexity of the problem. C3 just ensures that the powers cannot be negative. This is a mathematical constraint. And finally, C4 is the SIC constraint, where UN is the set of active users defined for the users that have positive power. And we restrict this set to be less than or equal to M. The second set of constraints are the individual power constraints, which is uh, similar. However, here, each user has its own power budget. This is naturally suitable for uplink, where each user's equipment, each, each user's devices have its own power limit. But it can also be applied to downlink to represent some effort fairness, or also to uh, put regulatory requirements on the transmit power to each user. Uh, these two problems, PC for the cellular one and PI for the individual one, have these inputs. And in order to study the computational complexity as a function of the input, we have to define what is the input size. Uh, so it is natural to define them as the number of users k and the number of subcarriers n. And we will assume that the other parameters are encoded in a constant number of bits. This is also a practical consideration um, for real system. OK, given that, we can start to study the complexity. For PI, we proved that it is strongly MP-hard for any objective function in the class that we define, and also for any number of superposition M. The idea is to find a polynomial time reduction from a known strongly MP-hard problem, that is the three-dimensional matching, to our problem. In addition, uh, we proved that MP-hardness is still true when the numerical parameters are bounded by a polynomial in K and M. This means that it is strongly MP-hard. This is the definition of strong MP-hardness. And the consequence is that there is no polynomial time algorithm for this problem unless P equals NP. And it means that trying to find an optimal solution in practice is not possible. But it doesn't say anything about any approximated solution for this problem. Regarding PC, the cellular power constraint problem, we don't know if it's MP-hard or polynomial time solvable. However, we know that there exists a pseudo-polynomial algorithm in J, where J is a new parameter that is the number of power values when the problem is discretized. Due to that, we can say that if the problem is MP-hard, it can be only weakly MP-hard at most. And this is also by definition. Nevertheless, we show that it is approximable. So there exists a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, FPTAS, that I will show in section four. OK, uh, in some special cases, the problem can be reduced and become uh, easier to solve. And in, in particular, they are polynomial time solvable. These special cases are, first, if the user selection UN is fixed, it reduces to a power control problem that can be solved by classical uh, optimization methods 
for these two uh, utilities, for example. If there is only a single user in the system, then we can just use the well-known water filling power allocation that we know maximizes the single user data rate problem. And finally, if there is only one sub in the system, a lot can also be done with different methods for different scenarios, constraints, and utility functions. <clears throat> now let's go to the, the real problem we want to solve, the weighted, weighted sum rate maximization with cellular power constraint. Uh, cellular will mean that we'll consider downlink, of course. And weighted sum rate is an interesting utility function as the weight can be tuned um, to, to achieve different uh, uh, trade-off between data rate performance and user fairness. And in, par in particular, the weights can be chosen by a scheduler uh, to achieve, for example, proportional fare over time uh, or, or different kind of uh, performance over time. So what we'll do is we we'll first uh, transform it to an equivalent separable problem. Then we will relax the problem and only consider the single carrier optimization. Finally, we'll solve the joint subcarrier and power location problem, and we'll show some numerical results. <clears throat> so, uh, to obtain this uh, equivalent problem, we make a change of variable. Our new variables are called xi, and it corresponds to the sum of the k minus 1 minus i plus 1 less decoded user power. For example, x1 is just the sum of all power on subcarrier n. And xk is just the power of the last decoded user on subcarrier n. Don't worry, I will come back to this with some uh, figures later. Uh, but for the moment, we can already derive a new objective function. Uh, so let's take the data rate of the user decoded in position i, like this one. We put everything at the same denominator, and we make the change of variable. Okay, fine. With this, we can obtain a new formulation for the objective function that is a sum of fi, where if each function fi only depends on a single variable xi, and represented like this. How about the constraints? We can change the constraint c by noting that x1 is equal to the sum of all power on a subcarrier. So we obtain this new constraint c1 prime and c2 prime. Um, for C3, we can note that the fact that the power is non-negative is equivalent to say that two, uh, the difference between two consecutive variables xi and xi plus 1 is non-negative also. And by writing this a bit differently, the fact that all powers should be non-negative can be written as this variable should be sorted in descending order. And finally, we also update the active user set using the definition that the power is strictly positive if two consecutive variables xi and xi plus 1 have a, 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 strong, uh, yeah, a positive gap. So let's see uh, how it works. Here we, we represent the value of this uh, xi by some bars. So this is a feasible allocation. It satisfies uh, C3 in particular. But this one is not because x4 is greater than x3. So this allocation doesn't satisfy the non-negativity of power. And in particular, we can read the power like this. The power is equal to the difference between two consecutive um, variables xi. So we see this here. And we can also see that the sum of all power is indeed equal to x1. So why do we care about this new formulation? Because the objective function now are separable. They are a sum of fi, where each fi only depends on one variable. And they are easy to study and optimize. So we know that depending on the parameters, they can either be concave and increasing, like the blue curve below, or they can be unimodal with a unique maximum, like the red curve above. In all cases, every properties of these curves can be obtained in constant time. In particular, we can obtain their maximum in constant time. And the same property holds if we consider a sum of consecutive function fi. And this is important, we'll use it later. So f1 plus f2 also satisfies this property, f2 plus f3 plus f4 and so on also satisfies this property, constant time maximum and so on. 
And finally, constraint C1 is the only one that depends on uh, different subcarriers. So how about we first relax this constraint to make the problem simpler? So by relaxing C1, we get a single carrier problem. We, since we uh, divided, we separated all the subcarriers. And in addition, we'll also relax constraint C4 so that there is no user selection. We only do power control. The input of this problem is a subcarrier N, a power budget P bar, and a set of active users that was already chosen beforehand. And for this problem, we develop an optimal algorithm with complexity M square called SCPC for single carrier power control. It works like this. We first set the power budget P bar here, which is the maximum value that can take these variables. Then we compute all the properties of this function. And we start to optimize starting from X1. So F1 is increasing. So the best value that we can give to X1 is the maximum value. X2 has a, a local a, a global minimum here in the middle. So the best value for X2 is this one, and so on. However, what happens here is that it is not feasible anymore. So how do we transform this one to a feasible allocation that is still optimal? Uh, we have to do some math, but very easy <laughs> mathematics. Because we can note that function F4 is increasing between 0 and C4. So in the optimal solution, X4, we always try to have the maximum possible value that is feasible. However, due to C, uh, constraint C3, we know that X4 cannot be greater than X3. So the maximum possible value it can take is actually equal to C3. This is due to constraint C3. So we know that the optimal solution will satisfy this. So it implies that in the orig original problem, the power of user tree is zero. So user tree must be uh, inactive. OK, so let's set user tree inactive. So we combine variable x3 and x4. They are the same now. And we also combine the function f3 and, f and f4. As we said earlier, all the properties are still preserved if we sum the function. So we can just combine these two uh, uh, functions and these two users together to make one. This just means that in the initial problem, user tree is inactive. That's it. But this is from the new mathematical point of view, we get this. And so we optimize it again, right? And like this. And this is the optimal feasible solution for this problem. Now, let's put back C4 because we want to make the, the problem more complicated to go back to JSPA at one point. So now we also have to do subcar allocation or user selection. Uh, and we have an optimal dynamic programming with complexity MK square, which is called SCUS, for single carrier user selection. And I will explain how it works. So we have the same problem, but now we don't know which are the M active user. And we have to find out. Maybe we can first try by assuming that user 1 is inactive, is, uh, sorry, is active. So if user 1 is active in the optimal solution, we can just optimize it. And then we can care about how to optimize x2 to x5. But maybe we are wrong. Maybe user i is inactive. In this case, we have to put x1 equal x2, combine user 1 and user 2. And we still ask ourselves how to optimize x2 to x5. So we see here that we decompose the initial problem into two sub-problems, where the range of the variables now are different. They are lower by one. We only care about x2 to x5. And this decomposition can be done again on these sub-problems. So by doing the decomposition recursively into sub-problems, we obtain this. This is called an optimal substructure because we are reducing it to sub-problems, but each one are optimal and preserve the optimality of the initial problem. The set of all sub-problems can be characterized by an array, V, with three dimensions of size M, K, and K. So one may wonder if this is exponential because it looks like a tree, but actually it's not, and that's the point of dynamic programming. It, it only has M, K squared sub-problems. Uh, and then we just apply a bottom-up dynamic programming where we start to compute V from the trivial values that are the leaves, and we go back to the root, which is our initial problem. So the, the complexity of this is mk square. But we'll see that we can even do better in terms of complexity because there is this one uh, observation that we did. 
so now let's go back to SCPC to understand this. <clears throat> let's say we have this power allocation on the left for the budget P max. And now we want to get another allocation, but for a lower budget P bar. Actually, it is not necessary to recompute SCPC. We can just truncate the allocation. And this truncation gives us also the optimal solution. <clears throat> However, this truncation costs way less than recomputed SCPC. In particular, the formula is given here, and this is linear in M. So what I just said is that any subsequent evaluation of SCPC can be done in linear time. And so the idea would be that instead of applying several time SCPC, if we need to apply several time, we can first pre-compute it with the maximum possible value Pmax, and then every successive evaluation can be done by truncation with lower complexity. So this procedure with pre-computation is called improve SCPC, and the same idea is applied to SCUS with improve SCUS. And we see that the complexity indeed goes from uh, for C evaluation, indeed, indeed goes from uh, quadratic to linear, and the same for SCUS. Only the, the, the pre-computation remains quadratic, but you only do it once, so that's okay. <coughs> uh, now that we have SCPC and SCUS, I think that we did everything we can for the single carrier optimization. Let's go back to JSPA. And uh, we can transform the JSPA problem to this one which is a two-stage optimization. The stage one consists in distributing the power budget Pmax uh, to different subcarriers, and the budget given to a subcarrier is called P bar. These variables P bar one to P bar n belongs to this feasible set that is just a simplex, so it can be computed very easily. Uh, but of course, every time we have this budget on a subcarrier, how do we know the performance of this? We have to run SUS because we have to know, uh, given this budget, what can be done on the, the subcarrier. So it's a two-stage in the sense that uh, every time we do an optimization of the first stage, but we need to evaluate the performance of capital F, which is the weighted sum rate, uh, we need to perform SUS. The first property we have regarding uh, this capital F that corresponds to the weighted sum rate of the system is that it is piecewise con concave, even piecewise strongly concave, which is very good. It means then we can apply gradient descent, right? But there is a problem. It is piecewise, and we cannot search all pieces exhaustively. The reason is that capital Fn on a single carrier has at most k pieces. However, the sum of uh, capital Fn has k to the power 1 n pieces. So if we have an algorithm that tries to search everything, it would be exponential. But we can still apply gradient descent. The only downside is that we will not converge to a global optimum, but only a local one. Uh, so we develop an algorithm called gradient JSPA, based on the projected gradient descent, where the search direction is uh, <coughs> consi um, consists in computing the gradient of this objective function south of Fn. And it can be done by SUS. And at each iteration, we perform a projection just to be sure that we are always inside the feasible uh, simplex search space. Uh, this converges to a local optimum in log 1 over xi iteration, where xi is the error tolerance at termination. And the complexity is very interesting. We can see here the, the part due to pre-computation and the one due to gradient descent. So on the left, you have the complexity of pre-computing multiplied by each subcarrier in which you have to pre-compute. And on the right, you have a linear term, that is the cost each time you want to evaluate SUS, multiplied and then by the number of iterations done by the gradient descent. So you see here that pre-computation is super important. Otherwise, the complexity would just be Log, log 1 over C times nmk square. So here we indeed reduce the complexity by a lot. And we'll be able to see this in simulation. <clears throat> um, so now we want to go even further. We want to develop optimal, near optimal solution, approximated solution. So for that, we'll apply combinatorial techniques. And we first need to discretize the power. So 
power p bar now can only take value of the form L delta, where L is an integer from 0 to j, and delta is the minimum uh, power that the, the system can deliver. So this is also a, this is also a practical consideration because um, in real system, <coughs> sorry, the, the hardware always have this kind of uh, uh, physical limitation uh, or precision regarding the, the transmit power. So we always have this delta in practical system. J is the number of uh, power values that the system can take. And this number is super important as we claim that the problem cannot be encoded in less than log j bits. A consequence of that is that the input size should take into account log j because its complexity can depend on log j. And if now we develop an algorithm that has complexity polynomial in j, we would say that it is pseudo polynomial. Otherwise, if it's polynomial in log j, we would say that it's truly polynomial. Okay. So uh, given this discretization, we, we can show that our problem can be again transformed into another one that is the multiple choice knapsack problem. The idea of multiple choice knapsack is very simple. Um, you have n classes of objects, of items. Each item has a profit and a weight. And the goal is to take one item from each of the class such that the, the total profit is maximized and that the, the weight is under a given budget. So you see that this is super similar to our case. In our case, the classes are the subcarriers. In each subcarrier, we define an item as a possible power location, and we can only choose one possible power location. This power location has a profit, that is what is the weighted sum rate it can achieve, and it has a weight, which is what is the power consumed. So we have the same objective. We want to take in each subcarrier one power location such that the profit is maximized and the weight is under the, the budget Pmax that we have. Now that we have this uh, very uh, like common uh, um, combinatorial problem, uh, we can use uh, a, a lot of tools that we have in hand. In particular, by using dynamic programming by weights, we can develop an optimal algorithm that we call optimal JSPA. And it has a complexity that is pseudo polynomial due to j and j square. We'll show later that this algorithm has lower complexity than the state of the art optimal algorithms. And we can also develop uh, a polynomial time approximation that we call epsilon JSPA and which is based on dynamic programming by profit. Uh, this is slightly more complicated than the previous one. And I just show here three uh, ideas that are necessary to make it work. First, we need a constant approximation procedure. We also need to rescale the profit. Rescaling is always necessary to achieve this kind of approximation. And finally, we use multi-key binary search to reduce the number of items that we actually um, evaluate. And this is where all the complexity uh, gain is. And so uh, from the FPTAS uh, property, we get that this approximation gives an approximation guarantee that is 1 minus epsilon times the optimal. So uh, the smaller the epsilon, the better. And the complexity here depends on log j and 1 over epsilon. Uh, this is what we wanted because it makes it polynomial. Uh, here you can see that we still have this j, but if we have time in, during the question session, I can answer why. Uh, the fact that here we have j doesn't make this uh, pseudo polynomial, but still truly polynomial. Um, okay, so we summarize everything inside this table, where we compare uh, two orders optimal algorithms to, our tr to the three algorithms we propose. Um, so let's first look at the three optimal ones. We can already put the monotonic optimization aside because its complexity is exponential. Then between the benchmark two-stage dynamic programming TSDP, which is the state of the, the art at the moment, and our optimal JSPA, we can compare the, the, the complexity. So looking just at the right term of our complexity, we see that we have a gain of a factor MK. Looking at the middle term, we have a gain of a factor J. 
And looking at the left term, we, ha we have traded a j for a k. And uh, this is actually better because, uh, so we have shown that this is not about theory, uh, but it's more about practice. We have shown that uh, if we want the system to work well and give a result that makes sense, j actually should be greater than k. And the idea is very simple. j is the total number of pieces of power you have. Since you have uh, k users, if you, if you, you want that uh, the user receive, they all received um, a piece of power, so they are all served, then j should be at least greater than k. But we can go even beyond is that if j is not one order above k, then there is no optimization because the solution would be trivial. So we can say that in theory j and k can take any value, so we cannot compare these two, but in practice j is always one order greater than k. So our algorithm is better and we'll show uh, it by simulation. Okay, we have the epsilon JSPA that I described earlier. And we have the gradient heuristic that is the best one in terms of complexity because it is only depend on log j. So for simulation, what we did is that um, for each point in the simulation, we dropped randomly, uh, uh, sorry, we, we uh, run randomly 1,000 instances. And in each instance, we drop randomly the users inside the cell. So they have random channel uh, conditions. And on the x-axis, we uh, simulate for different number of users k, from 5 to 60. On the left side here, you have the weighted sum rate of, of the optimal schemes versus the number of users. So uh, here, what we can observe, so the first curve corresponds to OMA. Then we have NOMA with m equal 2, two superposed users per subcarrier. And finally, OMA with m equal 3. Uh, what we can observe is that there is a, a performance gain of around 10 to 15 percent by, by using NOMA. Another thing that we can observe is that uh, between the curve that corresponds to optimal JSPA and the markers that are TSDP, they both achieve the same performance, but this is normal because we proved that they are both optimal. On the right side, we have the performance loss, so the ratio between the, per the performance of gradient JSPA and the optimal performance. This performance loss is represented in percentage, and the markers correspond to mean value, while the top bar corresponds to the 90 percentile. So what we can say here is that in this simulation environment, uh, for any case, uh, cases m equal 1 to 3, the average performance loss of our heuristic is less than 0.1 percent. So it is already super good. But we can go even... Uh, uh, <coughs> We can also say that it is even better when the number of users k become large. As we can observe here, the performance loss decreases as k increases, and it also decreases as m increases. So this is a good thing because in practice we don't care about system with five users. We want system with 60, thousand, uh, hundreds, and thousands of users. And in this case, we, see, we show that our heuristics we actually perform better if the number of users e is higher. Of course, this is average case and the 90 percentile. In terms of complexity, so we compare the, the basic operations performed by each algorithm. So when uh, I say number of basic operations, I mean uh, additions, multiplication, and comparisons. And for each algorithm, we have three curves corresponding to m equal 1, 2, or 3. And we have on the top TSDP, the, the benchmark, that has very high complexity. Then we have our optimal JSPA. And the same optimal JSPA if we used our pre-computation. So the, we call it improved optimal JSPA. Then we go to gradient JSPA and improved gradient JSPA. The first thing we observe is that uh, for k called 60, the, the, the complexity gain between the improved and non-improved one is around a factor 10. So it's already very interesting, both for optimal JSPA and gradient JSPA. And then, if we compare, for example, the benchmark and our improved optimal JSPA, there is a factor 1,000. And then if we go from uh, this uh, benchmark TSDP to the, the gradient heuristics, we have a factor 10,000. So we see that the factors are huge, and this is what makes some algorithms practical and others not. 
So what we say is that if you want to do simulations and you want to know what is the optimal solution for this simulation, you have time. Uh, then you can uh, use improved optimal JSPA, which will uh, give optimal results. However, if you want something that is practical and can be implemented in the real system, you have to go for the heuristic. <clears throat> and uh, finally, here we show the performance of the Epsilon JSPA, the approximation. So at the, denomin uh, sorry, <clears throat> at the x axis, we have 4n over epsilon. This, is, this may seem a bit weird, but 4n over epsilon is a very important parameter because it corresponds to the maximum number of items evaluated by epsilon JSPA. And this number of items can be compared to j, which is the number of items evaluated by optimal JSPA. So in the optimal case, you always evaluate 1,000 items. In the uh, approximated case, you evaluate 4n over epsilon. Here we represented on the graph, uh, J here, it is the, the third point. So we'll see how the, the performance can be compared to, to the optimal one. Uh, on the left, we have the weighted sum rate. The markers corresponds to epsilon JSPA and the curves are the performance guarantee. So we see first that in practice, epsilon JSPA converts much faster than the worst case performance guarantee that we gave. And in particular, we can see that when 4n over epsilon is approximately equal to uh, 300, we, we are already at the optimal. And we are way below uh, j that is required for optimal JSPA. On the right, we have the complexity. The markers are still epsilon JSPA, but now the, the constant line corresponds to the complexity of the improved optimal JSPA. Um, here we can see that the complexity of epsilon JSPA tends to the complexity of the optimal JSPA. This seems normal because uh, both IDs are based on evaluating items. So at one point, we may say that if the uh, approximation factor epsilon is small enough, we'll actually have the same complexity by evaluating all items and by evaluating uh, most of the items given by epsilon JSPA. But in reality, we see that there is still a gap and this gap in, is interesting. This gap is actually showing that the multi-key binary search that I explained earlier, in practice, still um, removes a lot of evaluation, a lot of items. So uh, here we have 4n over epsilon equal 4,000 on the right. It is still four times greater than the number of items evaluated by optim optimal JSPA, and still the complexity is below. So the multi-key binary search works very well. Okay, now I'll conclude, summarize, uh, talk about some future work and open problems. Um, in this thesis, we propose a unified framework where we develop uh, mathematical tools to analyze uh, the JSPA problem and facilitate the algorithm design that we want to be as general as possible. The idea throughout the, the whole work is always to decompose it to sub-problems and study their properties. We also analyze the computational complexity, and we believe that our framework is fle flexible enough uh, to be ex uh, extended to new constraints and scenarios. We provided three solutions for the weighted sum rate maximization with cellular power constraint. An optimal one that has lower complexity than the state of the art. Uh, the first polynomial time approximation scheme. And uh, a heuristics that seems to work pretty well by simulation. And we also developed some centralized and distributed algorithms for the sum rate maximization with individual power constraints. Uh, but this point is not discussed uh, during this presentation. So what are the possible uh, future works and open problem? Uh, first is uh, to extend the optimization framework. Um, for example, to consider new kind of utilities that are not included right now, namely the connectivity maximization problem which asks how many users can we connect given that each user wants a certain quality of service. And this is particularly suitable for massive machine type communications. Uh, we can also make the, uh, the model more realistic by considering imperfect channel state information and also multi-antenna technologies that are becoming more and more important these days. And in terms of tools, I think distributed resource allocation is very interesting because 
it can uh, change the trade-off we have between latency and uh, performance. So by making something more distributed, maybe we can win in terms of latency, but we lose a bit of performance. Uh, and, and finally, we believe that polynomial time approximation schemes are the good way to, is a, is a good way to um, get ag algorithms that have controllable complexity as well as controllable performance. And that's it for me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, the custom is that the expert, which uh, came from uh, the, the largest distance, uh, starts the discussion. In this case, our first speaker is Professor Vincent Poor. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, first of all, Lou, thank you very much. Uh, let me congratulate you on a very nice thesis and thank you for a very clear presentation. A very, you did a very nice job, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, now I just had a few questions and I'll, I'll ask them in increasing generality. Um, the first one, you may have said this, but I, could you go to your slide for seven? Oh. Uh, no, what is one? Okay. This one, yeah. So on the right. Yes. So, uh, do you have a? Can you explain why? So when you, as I understand it, as M gets larger, the overall performance gets better. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So what? Can you you have a sense as to why the loss relative to that gets better as M gets larger? Yeah, so there's this idea that uh, if you don't put any constraints on, of, on M, the, the solution anyway will have a finite M, right? And this M, the probability that this M is low uh, is, is quite high. So there's more probability that the optimal non-constrained problem has M equal 2, M equal 3, than M equal 6, for example. So that's why, you know, by increasing M, we are actually relaxing the problem and making it easier and easier. At, at one point, the probability that we find a, a, a problem in which uh, the, the solution has a very high M is uh, very low. I got you. I understand. So, so do, you have, do you have an insight as to why the heuristic solution works so well? Um, yes. So there are several ideas. Uh, the first one is that we can observe most of the time in practice, and this I cannot really explain, but we observe that the problem is actually globally concave. So we don't really have a lot of pieces, or we can have pieces that are very small and don't influence the global uh, optimum. And in the cases where we can see that they are uh, uh, very uh, obvious, uh, many um, local optimum. In this case, they are also very close to each other in terms of performance. And I think this is due to the fact that the Shannon's capacity is a log. So even when you make a bit of mistake in the optimization, you don't lose a lot of performance. I see. So you think there's a theorem in there? Do you think there's something, I mean, I know I'm not asking you to prove it today, but do you think there's some kind of approximate concavity that you could prove that would yeah, that, I think that's definitely possible, but it seems very challenging, and I don't have any clue right now how to proceed. Oh, uh, yeah, well, no, I'm not asking you to. I just wondered whether you had insight into that. Um, <coughs> let me ask you another thing. So, you know, I think a lot of what you're doing here is pretty general. I mean, you're applying it to NOMA, but I just wonder if you went beyond sort of the NOMA resource allocation problems, whether you might be able to apply these kind of methods and other other problems as well. I mean, you mentioned MIMO, mm -hmm. but I just wonder if generically you could forget about the fact that you're studying this NOMA problem and just look at a general class of constrained optimization problems and apply these methods. Uh, yes, I think so. The, the, the idea here to apply NOMA is also because NOMA is a very challenging problem and we wanted to show that the, a lot of things are possible uh, to be done on NOMA. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I've not looked in, into other um, 
scenarios, but I think it's definitely possible. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like, I mean, of course, the motivational part is NOMA and some of the decompositions and everything come from the, the way the uh, objective function, you know, turns out in NOMA. But I just think you could probably extract the, the whole problem into a class of problems with certain properties, you know, and, and everything would be the same. Um, so anyway, just something to think about. You know, I, I don't know whether, you know, I don't know enough about the optimization literature to know whether there might actually be, you know, already, you know, ideas like that out there. But it just seems to me like a pretty general and a pretty powerful, really practical set of solutions you have. Um, okay, let me ask one more general question, then I'll turn it up to the next person. Um, so you're, this is about NOMA, this thesis. Uh, it is a challenging problem. Um, you, I think your work makes it less challenging, but it's still a challenging problem. So what, what do you know about um, the status of NOMA in terms of mobile network standardization? Um, so I know that it has been discussed in the release 16 of 3GPP, and, but the idea is mainly to apply it for massive machine type communication and in particular the type of NOMA that is considered is code-based, code while this word is using a, a power domain NOMA. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so, so do you think we'll ever see NOMA in, uh, like, telephony, cellular telephone networks? I mean, maybe so, for 6G? I mean, what do you yeah, think? I, I mean, yes, in the future, of course, because it has a lot to gain, especially in terms of massive connectivity. Uh, but not right now, since the performance gain on uh, mobile broadband scenarios as this one I just presented are not huge compared to other technologies such as MIMO. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. All right, I think that's the last question I have. So again, thanks very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go mute. Thank you very much, Professor Poo. And now... Uh, uh, here for you, the, the, the uh, expert who has come from Paris, Sorbonne University. <coughs> Street, station. Street station of Metro from here. <laughs> uh, yeah, and thank you, Hello, for your talk. Uh, as I'm not an expert in, uh, in network, I will focus on, not on wireless stuff, but um, I want to focus on the double quality of, uh, of your work in both continuous and discrete optimization, because it's very rare to find work that have some interesting and deep results on both them uh, in optimization, uh, com uh, continuous optimization, you work on separable function, which is a very uh, good trick to, to see it, and uh, convexity, gradient algorithm, water filling stuff, and it's a, you have a big controls on th about that. And also on discrete optimization with complexity, use of mic, use of good heuristic. It's a very interesting and large work. And the, the, the more impressive uh, detail is the talk about J. Yeah. <laughs> I talked a lot by uh, email uh, uh, so, so a month ago about that and the analysis uh, precise of what can be the complexity of a mix uh, optimization problem and what is exactly the, the complexity and I learned some stuff I do not learn and I talk about people around me, well, complexity specialists and they don't have all in their mind also. So thank you for this work and your precision. Uh, so also of course I'm sure that your work is a double interest in both networks and optimization stuff so it's a double double interesting work. Yeah. So, uh, also I think your experimental results are very precise and interesting uh, and it's just a, a summary of all what you have in your, in your talk, in your document. And uh, I want to finish uh, saying that I want to emphasize the great pedagogical ability you have. Thank you. Both the document and we can see it also in the talk with all this great uh, picture that make the, the algorithm more interest, more um, Easy to understand, so thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, I have been nice, so now I'm being <laughs> so nice with some question. Uh, perhaps since I'm the nice guy here about network, I, I want to ask two questions about network, but it's my <coughs> question. 
um, among all your algorithms, since perhaps you work on real problems, is the, what are the ones that can be used in practice? So the one that has the most chance to be used uh, in this particular problem, not the other one that is only in the thesis, but uh, I would say it's a gradient JSPA in terms of complexity, but we would need, still need maybe more uh, uh, upgrades. Uh, so it's still possible that the complexity is still too high, but then uh, other kinds of upgrades that we can have is instead, instead of doing pre-computation, we can do this pre-computation offline and store it inside some lookup tables. This is one improvement for practical use. Another one is the gradient descent, we can stop it very early. We can say like we do three steps, it's already very good and we take this allocation. So you will use a centralized version and then you just uh, have to put uh, the, the, the solution inside both uh, the yeah. clients and antenna. Yeah. And uh, the other question is, your work is based on many physical hypotheses on both uh, Shannon uh, formula and so on. Uh, is there a, a limit about the signal power where the client is, cannot receive anything, or the antenna cannot receive anything. Uh, yes, I think so, but uh, then uh, all these kind of constraints, we can put it inside the optimization problem, and in particular, uh, so in particular here, for example, we have the maximum power that can be transmitted on a single subcarrier. And this, for example, we can put it as a practical constraint to avoid that we have uh, signals that cannot be received due to very high power, because due to amplifier issues. Talk about work where there is a minimum power that can have to be used yeah. uh, for a link. And uh, I ask myself if your separable uh, trick can be uh, still be true if we use such a constraint? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I, I don't think it will change the complexity. Actually, since uh, afterwards we um, discretize it, yeah. I think in this step we can this do step. almost everything. Because uh, I think it's a very important, in my point of view, uh, practical constraint, and it's not so uh, expensive to put it in your model, so on my yeah. self, is there is something I don't see? Uh, uh, in it, in it, in no, I would say that this model is more the one that fits the literature, the one that tries to, um, yeah, to be a unified framework. Yes, mm. uh, so not to add new constraints that are not present in other works. So um, now I talk about optimization, perhaps. Um, so you. Um, you say that uh, a lot of uh, your optimization, uh, the aim of your work is to have more fairness. You use several times this, uh, yes. this, this uh, concept, but you never really define it. And sometimes you say that this must is the objective function that brings some fairness in your optimization model. And how do you measure this fairness and why can you say that? Yeah, so there are several ways to see the fairness. We can uh, put the fairness directly inside the, the problem. So then it would be, for example, using a maximum utility. So this one uh, maximize the minimum uh, data rate among all users. So this is the most fair utility. Uh, and there is also the kind of utility. But we, also, we can also consider that the fairness is a problem that is above this one. So this one only optimizes the resources for one time slot. But uh, in practice, we have a lot of time slots. And the fairness are often considered over time. So you want that everybody is served uh, with some metrics uh, over time. Not, so for a single time slot, maybe it's not that useful. For in this case, I would say weighted sum rate is used in a lot of work because what they do is the, the weights here are changed um, from time slot to time slot by the scheduler uh, in order to achieve this fairness. For, for example, the weights can be uh, uh, set inversely proportional to the buffer size. So if someone has a very big buffer, 
then it has, uh, um, no, sorry, proportional to the buffer size. So big buffer means big weight, or it can be set inversely proportional to the prior data rate. And so in this case, the one that has a lot of data rate uh, in the path will have a low weight here. But you don't know the, the other weighted average function over? No, no, it's I don't. It's exactly the, the, the two ideas you have. Mm -hmm. the man, mix man, max mean function and this ordered uh, average. Okay. That is, you have to say that what are the minimal uh, person that receive the lower power, for instance, and then you put an eye weight, weight for him, and then the objective function is not so easy to, to solve, or sometimes over optimization parameter are incomplete because you need to sort people uh, through their the, the resources they have, and then order and then compute the optimization function. So it's not uh, an easy function. But what I want to say is that uh, fairness optimization problem is a domain also, and a multi objective, multi criteria optimization problem. And perhaps it's not so easy to use the word fairness without uh, using these uh, definitions. I understand. Perhaps you, so you can talk about fairness at the end of your work because you can have some measure at mm -hmm. the end, but if you have no real fairness objective at the beginning, it's not so easy to say that you're... Yeah, yes, it's true, yeah. Because what you're trying to optimize at first is not the fairness directly. The fairness yeah. So, yeah. One, perhaps one, one last, perhaps. A uh, very interesting section is the uh, game theory work you don't uh, have time to yes. present all what you have done. And uh, my question was at the end, you told you work on Nash equilibrium and so on, and there is very nice uh, uh, work, but it's uh, decentralized this time and not centralized either all the other. So how can you how can you compare this game theory algorithm to the others? Can you have some um. Measure and the time also. Yes, I don't have the figures here, but uh, so I compare them in terms of performance because if you look at the joint optimization space, it's actually the same for both. Just the way they move inside this space is different. So in terms of performance and even complexity, uh, I compare them yeah, in the figures, in the thesis. And that's the only uh, thing I did, but also, um, what I wanted to show is the price of anarchy, which is the gap between the Nash equilibrium and the optimal solution. Yeah, it's certainly the, the classical measure. Another measure is also the time of, uh, of uh, exchanging data to have a centralized location against a decentralized one. So when you compare these two types of algorithms, it's certainly important to also have this notion that it's another work. I see, I see. Yeah. So my last question was about the FPTAS because it's the first time I see them for practical work. <laughs> Always uh, FPTAS are quasi uh, theoretical analysis of algorithms or problems in order to to produce uh, uh, what can be a, a fine uh, analysis of the where the problem becomes um, difficult or not. And when there is no epsilon pitas, for instance, it's a hard problem. So you say that you can see in your work the uh, usefulness of uh, of fpitas, and I'm so yeah. interesting like that. If you can just come back to that. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the slides, but maybe it's yeah, this it was, one. Yeah. Um, so, oh no, let me go to another one. So uh, here, as I said earlier, for uh, real uh, implementation, only this one can be used. So uh, then what's the point of this? And I would say that is for uh, simulation, for benchmarking, because when you want to develop a new algorithm, you will compare it to the optimal. The thing is, as you can see here, TSDP, the benchmark one, I can only make it to 30 users, 1,000 instance, but I cannot make it for 60 because the complexity is very too high. The same thing can be said for optimal JSP. At one point, maybe 100, I will not be able to simulate anymore. And then I can just take uh, epsilon J JSPA, 
Of course, I will have to make some tuning on epsilon, but then I, uh, I would be able to say here I have a near optimal solution, just a one minus epsilon, and I can do the simulation. So that would help, but of course, this can still not be implemented in hardware for, for real uh, allocation. And how you compute epsilon? Exactly. You have an idea about that? Uh, by hand, I would by say, hand. yeah. Very interesting idea. Use of FPTs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I ask uh, uh, Professor Sibla uh, uh, to take. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, congratulations for this work. Uh, I think it's a really nice work on optimization because the function is not easy at all. And very special because it's a log of a ratio with a specific ratio you know now. Yeah. And you try to, to use this specificity to, to find an almost optimal algorithm and to, to, to build the super variable functions as an objective function. And, well, and so the, the tricks you use are, are, are very nice and I think they will, they will be reused by some others in the future. Thank you. And that's why it's very interesting. <coughs> I was also very pleased by your presentation, which was uh, very clear, very clear, and actually much clearer than your, okay. <laughs> your manuscript, especially for the explanation about uh, the optimization of your of your function and the way you you, you merge the x. And so. Uh, so perhaps the figures will be. You mm. don't have to modify your manuscript, but uh, yeah. the, fi the figure you could be well um, welcome in your in your manuscript. But uh, okay, so I have some questions. Okay. So the first one is about fairness. So mm -hmm. I think it was not a, a good idea to start with fairness. Okay. <laughs> because you don't manage fairness at all. Yes. Uh, but I have uh, uh, just, a, just a, it's a comment on the question, so I don't know exactly, but we'll see at the end. Okay. Uh, so that perhaps we can use the slide 14. Okay. So just to have a support. Mm. The presentation as well. 14? Uh, yes. Uh, oh. No, no, 13. So okay. or even this one? Two. Okay. So if you don't apply NOMA, uh, so if, for example, if you apply NOMA but without seek, mm -hmm. it's a non orthogonal multiple access but without seek, yeah. second user. So like this, this SNR. Yes, this one. Yes, this one. Uh, Finally, this system is more is more fair than your normal with seek because user for the user one is the same, but for user two it's worse. So finally, user two is closer to, to user yes. one. Okay. And, uh, so finally, when you apply normal with seek, you increase the unfairness of your system. Yeah. And then you would like to to add fairness in the system in which you increase the unfairness. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so what's happening then? So <laughs> I, I think there is something about that here. Yeah, here with fixed power, of course, uh, we are making it unfair. But then in the optimization, we can always uh, change this. So we can, for example, choose that user one is alone, and we pair differently the users. Yeah, but you want fairness, so it means you want, for example, if you apply your max min, mm -hmm. it means usually you force. R2 to be equal to R1, mm -hmm. usually is quite the solution. Yeah. And, uh, but here you, you apply a technique to, to, to create a big distance between R2 and R1, and then you apply a criterion to force R1 to be equal to R2. Yeah. So yeah, I, there is a trunk, 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 I, I understand. There is a gain. Um, so there's a, another remark that w what you just say is. Uh, only valid for downlink because in the end uplink yes. we do something else. Yeah. For downlink. Yes. Yeah, for downlink. Uh, so I I don't really know, but uh, I, I yeah <laughs> I I would say that the thing is um, we, with Noma we can uh, always achieve the same performance uh, as with Oma if in the optimization we choose not to superpose. 
but in that case, you go back to OMA. But yeah, but only for some without, users. For Sorry? You can do NOMA without a ah, SIC. Yeah. But then the thing is, uh, why would someone do that? Of course, it's more fair. But then, uh, I don't know. It seems to me that if we can change, uh, so if we, we can optimize the power, there will always be a combination of power in the NOMA combined with OMA case that is always better than using, using NOMA without SIC. And it's, it's the same level of fairness. Yeah. Okay. It seems to me that using NOMA without SIC on purpose is, uh, does not seem to be like the best uh, solution because I don't know. Uh, yes, I guess. Have, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, my second question is about your, your utility function. So, uh, so you apply maximization, or you, you consider maximization of the mean of the weight. Uh, and for the mean, sometimes it's uh, a weighting mean, sometimes yeah. it's a mean, sometimes it's an harmonic mean. Okay. Yes. At the end, it's always a mean. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an idea how to manage uh, energy efficiency in your program? Because here you have a sum of log, and the log depends on the fraction, okay, the fraction between powers. And, uh, and so you lose convexity, but you try to, thanks to your trick, you, you, you still come back to, to, not to convexity, but you, you are able to exhibit the, the optimization, the optimal value. But now if you add a common denominator due to the mm -hmm. energy consumption, uh, you lose almost all your tricks, I think. Yes. And then your numerator is bad. Yes. No, but actually in the literature, people have had some idea. Uh, and there are two ways to do it. The first is to consider multi-objective optimization. So in this case, they don't really combine the two objectives inside the same utility function, but they study what kind of operating point we can get between a trade-off between power consumption and uh, utility. And the second point of view is, like you said, to combine the two. Yeah, and uh, they use very different techniques. So uh, their techniques are based on an iterative algorithm that uh, has a, a nice convergence property. So they can prove that each time uh, they decrease some uh, uh, parameters. And by doing so, they converge to a solution. But still, they cannot prove the performance of this uh, equilibrium. OK, and my last question is about, is about the property of your function. So the fact that your function is piecewise concave? Yes. Uh, is it mentioned in your manuscript? Yeah. Do, do, where, do, do you know where exactly? Uh, let me check. Ah, yeah. uh, 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 Fiorent 14 on page uh, 58. Ah, uh, no, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, I understand your point. I see. So, yeah, actually, it is inside, but in the proof that oh, is yeah. inside the appendix here. Yeah. I did not really okay. state it in the theorem, but I can add it later okay. in the theorem. So just, uh, okay, so piecewise concave means you are concave, and there is a point where you, the concavity is, a bro is broken. Yeah. And then you, you jump in another, in another function which is concave and so on. Yeah. So for example, if you look at your gradient algorithm, uh, so I think your gradient algorithm will stop on the point, uh, on the broken point. Uh, but there is no way to jump from a, a concave piece to another one? Uh, the, con the pieces are not necessarily uh, with a, a, a maximum. It can also be strictly increasing, for example. But you have yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but in that case, you, your gradient algorithm will not see this point. No. Yeah, so it will just pass through okay, and go to another piece. Point is not an issue yeah. For the so it can be an issue if the gradient is almost zero. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but you, there is no way to 
to look at what's happened. Well, when you, you, you see, by the way, that your gradual algorithm start to converge, mm -hmm. uh, there is no way to, to see, to say, okay, now perhaps I am, uh, perhaps I am in a local optima, optimum, and perhaps it's, I, I have to, I have to change my concave function, and so I have to look at what's happened in the neighbor, and first to, to look at yeah. uh, in the neighbor, but not in the so small neighbor, because if, if you do that, you stay in your, in your neighbor. And, uh, and so to, to try to see another concave part of your function, yeah. did you try that? No? Uh, no, we didn't try for the reason that when we studied uh, how the function looked like, if, 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 and we, if we did sometimes, the gain would be very small and it will only happen uh, from time to time, but this is very, uh, it's not something that happens often. And so at the end, we'll put a lot more of complexity to only get, get a small gain. So for example, we already showed that the performance loss of uh, uh, this gradient is already very low. So at the end, let's say you, you gain like uh, a factor two, you will still not see it very clearly here. So that's why we didn't try. But uh, definitely that's possible by using um, local search techniques or also um, uh, some people have used uh, restart. So at one point you say, okay, I'm fine with this path. I just restart the algorithm somewhere else. And okay. you do restart a few times. Or you can also apply... You do that if you know nothing about your function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Function. Ah, okay. So concave, perhaps you can do a no, bit more, no, you cannot do anything. No. Um, yeah. Otherwise, the there would be a way, I think, to get a polynomial time algorithm if it was possible to extract all the. Or maybe maybe we can go back to the approximation, uh, the FPTAS that we developed. Like maybe there's a way from the concavity point of view to do the same thing. That is, by doing something on gradient, we get an approximation, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a turn of uh, supervisors, there is supervisors, and uh, I will start by um, Kevin, would you like to ask some questions? Do you have some remarks? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with this thesis, and uh, you did an excellent work for this research problem. So, uh, indeed, uh, during the last three years, I already asked uh, many or too many questions to him, yeah. always. So, <laughs> I don't have a further technical question today, and a little bit of time. So, maybe I would like to pass the token to Marcel. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for the jury for participating. Uh, bon, bah, thank you, Lou. Uh, it was a great pleasure to work with you. I learned a lot with you. Uh, I think you were one of my best PhD students. I don't say the best because some mm -hmm. may complain. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, uh, you, are, you have a very strong background in optimization, and so, so it was very nice. And, uh, uh, you are very, also very humble, uh, always very calm. Some, sometimes I, I was more stressed than you, <laughs> but um, for those who know the expression, you, you was like a uh, force tranquil, uh, taking uh, step by step all the problems and solving them. So, uh, yeah, nothing to add. So, very nice. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I will speak in, in, in the end. Thank you very much for the degree and thank you uh, very much for asking questions. I will have uh, less questions, actually, almost no questions at all. Uh, um, uh, as they were asked before, uh, uh, what I really liked was the, 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 the thesis document, which was very nice to be read. I appreciate it very much, and uh, it was a good idea to put the proofs at the beginning, as they are very voluminous and technical, so it's better not to have them uh, in, in, in the place, in the, in the main text, as they are too huge. What I really uh, like is um, the treatment of the problems. The problems are treated in the integrality. 
So it's, uh, for instance, for weighted um, sum rate, we have the optimal algorithm, we have uh, approximate, uh, approximation algorithm, we have a heuristic. For me, this FPTAS scheme was uh, as showed that the problem is not so hard as this type of algorithm exists, and it would be logical as Oma uh, uh, of the uh, is, is, is polynomial. So it's just, ra it's, it's NP hard by, but rather nice globally, I would say. Um, the another, uh, the another uh, problem, this uplink is not so easy, I would say. So I, I, um, I have some question, the, 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 the uh, very general ones. Um, the one aspect has been already treated a little bit. It is the energetical stuff, as uh, uh, this 5G technology has a reputation of being very energy consuming. The, the, the energy consumption is estimated in tetra kilo, tetra uh, watt hour, something like this, enormous. And um, the, the energy consumption and the fairness, it's, it's a little bit a similar question as you have this extraction, cleaning of interference, you need energy to do this. So uh, I think that uh, treating NOMA with energy constraint uh, will be needed once. I have, um, I have a question concerning this uh, this uh, downlink uh, um, uh, problem. To have the the algorithms working well, I need to clean up the the interference in a good order. Could you please tell me how the base station does it? I mean, it's measure the, the distance, the, the, the mesh, how, how it's possible to do this on the fly, to, yeah. to, to, to achieve the goal, to have the good performance. Yeah, so actually it will get something that is called channel state information. Yes. That is the, classical stuff. Yeah, is the estimation of the channel by uh, discussing, communicating with the user. Mm -hmm. uh, this also causes latency and causes energy consumption, yeah. Uh, in this work, we consider that this is perfect. So uh, we get this inf perfect uh, channel state information. So, I mean, in, in the optimization problem, it's not uh, an issue for us because it's an assumption. But of course, uh, in practice, we can have imperfect one. I mean, the, the, the estimation is always imperfect, but we can also assume that we know even less thing. For example, as you said, we can, just take the information of the distance and try to do something. <laughs> so we know the distance, but the channel is random between it. Mm -hmm. And we can try to use the statistic of the channel to have an algorithm, a uh, stochastic optimization that works well in average, for example, or something like that. So it's kind of yes. stochastic estimation not to measure and order the, the user of the time as it's supposed to treat the whole cell. Yes. So it will be... Yeah. And this is something that I think is one of the most important things if we want to extend the, the framework. Uh, okay, another <coughs> question. Uh, um, I have um, a question about uh, um, a gradient uh, GSPA uh, performance. Yes. So this is uh, the page uh, for, uh, 64, and this, oh, this is the same. Um, and diagram. So even in the stand probably we have the grad GSPA M1, donc it's equal to OMA, classical yes. one. Donc the, so the, um, uh, the, the perfect um, solution is given here. How much does it cost to compute um, classical OMA to, to have an idea Ah, yeah. So it is this one, the, the little stars, brown stars, that corresponds to OMA. And this is, but, but I understood that the OMA is for M equal to 1. Yeah. 
I don't say uh, it's LDDP for, and after that it's very huge. But Oma mm -hmm. for one user, it should be polynomial. Um, I I think it's only polynomial if we have if we don't have weights or equal weights. For general weights, I think it's not polynomial anymore, because. Uh, without weights, you always has this idea that you can sort the user from weak to strong. But if you put weights, for example, you put high weights on the weak user, it's not trivial anymore if you should give power to the weak user but with a high weight or to the strong user with a low weight. So I believe that uh, with general weights and all the constraints that I define, mm -hmm. uh, even OMA is uh, MP complete. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. So for this reason, you, you don't uh, have this value on the, on the diagrams. Um, another question, uh, I had uh, concerns as uh, another side of, of our problem. So it's an uplink. And if I understand properly, if I understood properly, you, your assumption is about a uh, user synchronization on the cell? Uh, is it realistic, at, at least for the water filling algorithm? Can you remind me the context? Uh, uh, I, I understood that uh, the user's uh, synchronization is needed for uh, water filling. You have some uh, uh, algorithm, uh, 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 algorithm 12 assumes that users are synchronized. And they update the power of ah, yes. the yes. is extremely strong. I yes, think. but this can, so I didn't discuss in the thesis. Maybe somewhere I put one sentence, but maybe not. I, 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 so I, I was a little bit. Uh, yeah, I said that uh, I did this for simplicity of simulation. Yeah. But uh, there are other works that shows that the iterative water filling defined there uh, has the same convergence properties, even in a asynchronous case. So for simplicity, I took the synchronous case, but I think that these algorithms, if we apply them to asynchronous, it will work exactly the same. Uh, this is your opinion, you haven't... Uh, uh, so I'm not 100% uh, sure, but since this other work shows that all these properties are preserved even in uh, asynchronous case, I think maybe with some work we can show that. Okay, uh, I have another question which can be naive. But I don't have any feeling about this problem. So you have kind of, uh, a bunch of iterative uh, algorithms, and uh, you always start from the arbitrary point, which is the simplex, the simplex corner, etc. What is the nature of the convergence? Do you have an interest to start somewhere in the neighborhood of the solution? Because it's it is always in the, in the corner, which is yes. Why, why not? Uh, uh, if the convergence is proven, but maybe you can speed up. Yeah. I, actually, I think if you choose uh, equal allocation at first, everybody gets the same power. You you save one step because oh. usually you know by going from the corner to the center, you use one step. So by doing this, you save one step, I think. So it's actually, uh, it's not worth of uh, trying to, 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 to change because uh, the convergence is... I mean, one step is still interesting in some cases. So yeah, we can, I mean, it's something interesting <laughs> that can be done. Uh, and the last question will be the philosophical one. Uh, because I, I, I know by chance uh, uh, that you did uh, much more in your, during your three years than the, the, the document says. Your, your Bible, bibliography list is much longer. And uh, I understand that uh, the research line listed in the thesis uh, are always, uh, in relationship with the thesis topic. But uh, I would like to know uh, which are you wish to study in the future. What uh, different topics uh, you would like to treat more sexy, more um, ho 
not more challenging, more interesting, more practical. What else? Because mm -hmm. the, 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 the uh, further works marked concerns only Norma and... Yeah, I think what I like is optimization problems. And so I'm, I'm looking at where the difficult optimization problems are. Where, uh, so it was the case for Norma, but also on the projects I work on, for example, there's one about uh, uh, private information coding in the cloud or things like that. Uh, so uh, uh, to answer your question, I would say where well, there are optimization problems. But personal, your personal feeling, do you have any problem? No, I, no. Actually, I don't know. I mean, I will discover them later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.